Um, thank you. Thank you, Matt, for that warm welcome, though I, I cannot believe that you're talking about the Six Nations when the sporting event this weekend is the quarterfinal of the African Nations Cup when Togo play Burkina Faso. Now, Togo have waited since the beginning of time to reach the knockout stages of the Africa Cup of Nations, so don't miss it tomorrow afternoon about uh, uh, six o'clock on some obscure uh, ITB 17 or something like that. But anyway, you'll, it'll emerge in a moment why I'm interested in Togo. Um, who am I and what do I do would be a good way to start. Um, I'm just gonna take my watch off, which as, as they say, you know, the, uh, it doesn't mean a thing. Um, my name is Stuart Weir, I live in Oxford. Uh, I have been involved in Christian ministry to sport for the last um, 22 years. First of all at Christians in Sport and most recently in a charity called Verity Sport, uh, which is basically me. Um, I do three things. I, I write. I, I write. Um, I write about sport, about sport and Christianity. I do a little bit of journalism. Uh, I give some pastoral support to Christians involved in elite sport, uh, and I have some international projects. Um, my, you know, it has been a tough year for me, 2002, because my employers insisted that I went to the European Football Championships in Ukraine, then the Olympics, and then the Paralympics. But you know somebody has to do it. And it's mainly the um, Olympics I'm going to talk about. Um, in 2008, I was in Beijing uh, writing for the Oxford Mail, uh, which was great because it put me in the inside and gave me a chance to have access to people I wanted to support. Um, I had hoped that I'd be able to do the same at London, but um, there were 3,000 UK written press applying for 300 people and I was one of the 2,700 who didn't get one. But um, I have a project in Togo and Togo, if you are not familiar with it, is a small country uh, between Ghana and Nigeria. And I'm sure that this is such an educated group that if I were to say, can you tell me the name of one person from Togo? somebody might be able to do it. There's only one person anyone has ever heard of from Togo. Any takers? Adebayor. Adebayor is the only person that anyone has ever heard of from Togo. Um, now, I have a project in Togo where I support a girls football team. And uh, because it's such a small sports culture, uh, I go every year, and when I go there, I try to visit the Olympic Committee. And I visited the Olympic Committee in uh, 2011, and I met the president, uh, uh, the president of the Olympic Committee. Uh, incidentally, uh, he's a, uh, there are two ways to address him. You can call him Monsieur le Président, uh, or the General, uh, because he's a retired army general. Um, and as we talked, he just casually said to me, you know, we could use somebody like you who understands how England works. And, you know, I just thought, throw away a line, oh yes, thank you very much, didn't think anything more about it. And then, a few months later, I got an email saying, um, there's a meeting of uh, chiefs of Olympic committees in London, a year out from the Olympics, could you go along and meet uh, our chef de mission, as they're called? So I went along, had dinner with him on the first day of that conference, and in the evening he said to me, oh, I was asked today, do you have an Olympic attaché? And I said yes, and gave them your name. Now, literally, the first thing I did when I went home was Google Olympic attaché, <laughs> because I had absolutely no idea what this was. And then I rang a friend at the British Olympic Association and said, I've just been asked to be an Olympic attaché. What is that? And um, if I can put it just quite factually, um, dealing with an Olympic 
an African Olympic Committee, there was always a doubt in the back of my mind as to whether this would actually come off. You know, would they actually get around to putting the paperwork in? Uh, would the person who was the president of the committee still be the president of the committee a year later? And all that. But amazingly, amazingly, um, one Friday in early July, I met the chef de mission at St Pancras off the Eurostar, and he said, I have your accreditation in my briefcase. And it all started. Now, in the Olympics, I was doing four things. I was the Olympic attaché of the Togo committee. I'll tell you a little bit about all of these in a moment. I um, was doing the logistics for the chaplains, because there were 19 international chaplains, and I was doing the logistics, travel, accommodation, uh, managing the budget, and so on. Then I was supporting Olympians that I knew, and I wanted to enjoy the games insofar as that was possible. So let me just give you a little bit of background as to how the Olympics actually works. Now, the athletes live in a village, which is a secure uh, village accessed by, you have to have the right pass to get in. Um, uh, that, that was in Stratford, just behind the big shopping centre. Um, the athletes uh, have all their meals in there. There's this enormous restaurant which seats about 3,000, which is open 24-7, where all the food is free. <laughs> Heaven on earth, really. Uh, and um, you know, it, it's rather, rather funny because there's a McDonald's in there where you just go up and you get served and it's all free. You know, I, find, I find after the Olympics, I, I went into a McDonald's and I was horrified that they wanted to charge me. Um, but the interesting thing is that, that the drinks that are available are all only the, the right sponsor's drinks. For example, there's Coke but no Pepsi. Uh, the fruit juice is only innocent. Uh, the, the water is, I can't remember who had the contract for the water. So it, it's very interesting that, that, that it's a legal minefield even there so in terms of the food, like, a, like it's McDonald's and not Burger King or Kentucky or anything else. Um, <clears throat> the athletes live in the village, they then travel to their venues in athlete-only buses. Um, and as the um, Togo Olympic attaché, I was not sleeping in the village, but I had complete access to the village. I had all my meals in the village. I had uh, you know, meals with the athletes. I was able to travel with the athletes to venues. Um, and so it was the most brilliant situation from which to do the, the ministry I was doing. Um, there will be a few name drops in the middle of this. I don't, I don't do this arrogantly, but just, it's just utterly ridiculous some of the situations I find myself in. Uh, like the morning that Ryan Giggs got me coffee. Um, now, I was very, very conscious that I was a kind of an outsider and I was lucky to be there. And so therefore, you know, if you see somebody um, with their mates, you don't go and sit next to them. But I also had the ethos that if somebody was on their own, it was perfectly reasonable for me to go and sit opposite them. So I go into breakfast one day and there's Ryan Giggs sitting on his own. Uh, the football team played a couple of games at Wembley and were sort of in just, just at those times. So anyway, I get my breakfast, I go and sit opposite uh, uh, Ryan Giggs. I mean, I sat opposite Matt today, but you know, you, you, you can't have it all. Um, so anyway, uh, I sit next to Ryan Giggs. Craig Bellamy comes and obviously recognizes me and sits, or oh, perhaps it was Ryan, he recognized, who knows, uh, comes and sits there. And a few minutes later, the entire football team is around us. Um, conversation is, is very easy. And then Ryan gets up and says, I'm having a coffee, does anyone want one? And I thought, this is a moment not to miss. <laughs> so that's the day that Ryan Giggs got me coffee. How ridiculous. Um, the, what, what does the Togo Olympic Atashi do? Now, that's a question that I didn't know either. Um, in the build-up to the Games, I attended occasional meetings at LOCOG on behalf of Togo because... You know, I'm in Oxford and they're in Togo, so they couldn't really afford to send somebody to meetings. And um, in the Olympic Village, every country decorates their accommodation with flags. 
But now let's say, let's imagine that a particular country turned up at the Olympics without any flags. I mean, it couldn't happen, of course, but let's say an Olympic committee turns up without any flags. I can now tell you that there's a company in Chesterfield which supplies the flags of the world which you can order on the internet. Uh, as that was one of my first tasks. Um, then uh, I went to meetings with the athletic coach. Uh, I speak French and most of the, their team didn't speak English, so that was a role I had. Um, two days before the, the athletics started, the athletics coach, by the way, Togo had six athletes. We had two runners, judo, table tennis, kayak, and swimming. And the athletics coach came to me two days before the uh, uh, athletics started and said, right, I've got the vests that the runners are going to wear. Um, we just need to have Togo printed on them. Two days before the event. I don't imagine that G Team GB were doing that. So anyway, uh, I found out quickly that the shopping centre of the Westfield, if any of you were at the Olympics, you know, the big shopping centre in Stratford, there was a sport and soccer, and they did screen printing. So yeah, yeah, we can go down there. Uh, first of all, there was a major discussion between the athletics coach, the treasurer, and me as to who was paying for this. So anyway, uh, and of course, the, the girl sprinter uh, you know, wears a very small top, and the person doing the printing was worried that there wasn't going to be space to put it on, and so we had to assure her that if, it, if she made a mess, we wouldn't blame her. But eventually we got Togo printed on the, on the, on the vests. Um, oh, the other thing is that I sat in on quite a number of meetings with the committee, and um, you can only pay for things at LOCOG in two ways. Cash in pounds, or with Visa, you know, Visa being the sponsor. Now, Togo had lots of money with them in euros. So I finished up being the person with the Visa card. So I was sort of uh, paying bills for them, and at one stage I got to the point where I was owed 400 pounds. Now, I tried to be philosophical about this and say to myself, you know, this is the most amazing experience of my life. If you'd said to me beforehand, you can have this experience, it'll cost you 400 pounds, I'd probably said okay. But in the end, I got completely reimbursed uh, in euros. I mean, I was a little bit amazed that Locog in, this, in the modern world with Lloyd's as a corporate sponsor couldn't find a way of accepting euros, but anyway. Uh, or the Togo, again, in the modern world couldn't find a way of knowing in advance that, that you needed something other than, uh, than euros. But there we are. Uh, but then, you know, that's what Olympic attaches are for. Um, now, what else did I do? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the thing that I really wanted to do was to support the Olympians that I knew. And because I had sort of worked particularly in track and field athletics over the last uh, uh, four years, um, I, I knew about 30 athletes with some kind of Christian faith, uh, British, American, African. And of course, being in the village, I had a great opportunity of, of seeing them, encouraging them. All except for the American long jumper, Will Hay, who didn't bother living in the village because his grandma lived in West Ham. I kept telling him he should be jumping for us. Um, and, uh, you know, just being in the dining room I would, or wandering around the village, I, I would uh, bump into um, uh, athletes and... Uh, Another thing I was doing, um, I, I do a weekly devotional email to sports people, and I decided to do um, one every day when I was uh, at the Olympics. And I'll just read a typical one. I'll just, just give you a flavor of this. This one I sent out on the 23rd of July. Identity. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled. Do not be afraid. John 14, 27. In Beijing, I attended a meeting where the British chef de mission described the Al British Olympic team as one of the most exclusive groups in the world because money cannot buy you a place. 
you have to earn it by your performance. As the Olympic model puts it, you have to be higher, faster, or longer than everyone else. So you can justly be proud to be an Olympian, to be part of that exclusive club. You are rightly proud to have been chosen to represent your country. And for life, you can call yourself an Olympian. But as a follower of Jesus Christ, you have a higher identity. You were created by God and redeemed by Jesus. Being an Olympian will not give you peace. It might give you stress, but probably not peace. When the risen Jesus appeared to the disciples, his first words were, peace be to you. He offers you the same peace today. So that was just a typical thing, about 200 words, uh, enough that somebody might read it. And of course, the thing about sending this kind of thing out is you really never quite know whether people are getting it, reading it. But I was encouraged by the feedback I got. Um, I mean, there was one American athlete who emailed me back and said, thank you for the daily dose of Jesus. Uh, the Indian hockey captain, um, who I have emailed regularly for the last two years since meeting in the Commonwealth Games, and never once did she reply to anything, said to me in the village, oh, thanks for your email. I'm passing it on to five others in the team. I might never have known. Um, now, I had no idea what access I would have as an Olympic attaché, but to have access to the athlete transport, to the restaurant to the athlete warm-up area was amazing. Now, uh, just let me talk you through the procedure. And, and a runner, athlete runner, uh, is competing. Uh, so they go to the transport area, get on the bus that takes them to the warm-up area, which is a little stadium, um, which is uh, just next to the main stadium, with a tunnel. Um, going from one to the other, but a five-minute walk. And uh, so they would arrive in the warm-up area, prepare, then they'd be called into the call room, they'd walk through this tunnel, they'd compete, and then they'd walk back through the tunnel uh, and uh, do their warm-down. Um, and that tunnel, actually, for me, became holy ground. Because when people compete and they're finished, they really don't want to stand and talk to you for five minutes. But if you can actually go with them. So I was able to walk with so many athletes through that uh, tunnel, perhaps say a prayer as we walked, um, and, and so on. Um, I mean, just, just let me give you a couple of little, little stories about how I met athletes. Because as I say, I'd, I'd worked at various world championships. And one of the best world championships I went to was Daegu. Korea 2011, where um, because I was accredited as a journalist, um, I would any athlete I didn't know whom I thought was a Christian I'd ask for an interview with, and in the course of the interview we would talk about faith and uh, uh, I'd try to support them as well. And I had this lovely meeting with a Nigerian uh, athlete who brought her media officer with her. We had a great interview, she talked very openly about faith, and at the end of the uh, interview, um, I said to the athlete, could I pray for you? And she said, sure. So I pray for her. And when I finished the prayer, I noticed that the media officer was sort of looking daggers at me. And I just suddenly thought, oh, oh, she's about to tell me that it was unprofessional of me to pray when I'd asked for an interview. And I was just about to say, I'm sorry, you're absolutely right. But what she said to me was, why did you pray for the athlete and you didn't pray for me? And then she told me that she was single and she really wanted to be married, and I prayed for a husband for her. <laughs> and then there was another occasion when, um, after a press conference, uh, you know, the, the, there are always press conferences with three medalists. And one of the medalists um, talked about her faith in that situation. So I went up to her afterwards in this situation. So I would be standing there and uh, opposite the athlete and said, look, um, I'd love to talk to you a bit more. Could we meet tomorrow? Could I do an interview with you tomorrow? And she said, sure. Can you arrange it through the American uh, media officer? Sure. 
So I go and find the American media officer, but to two minutes after this, in the press center, and said, um, I'd like to meet Jenny tomorrow. And she says, I know. I said, how do you know? And she says, well, I think you'll find that most people know. Because when you asked her, the mic was still live. <laughs> And not only does the sound go in the room of the press conference, but through the entire media room. <laughs> At least I hadn't said anything inappropriate. <laughs> um, you know, I knew 30 athletes in the Olympics, and during the time I was able to pray with 20 of them, some of them several times. You know, some of those were prearranged. You know, sometimes an athlete would say, I'm competing tomorrow, could we just pray tonight? Or, I mean, I remember a Kenyan athlete who saw me, now this is going to be interesting with holding the microphone, but a Kenyan athlete that I knew saw me in the dining room and just did this, you know, can we pray? Uh, and that was a great privilege. Um, and, uh, you know, others, you, I, mean, I remember praying with somebody just at the breakfast cereal. You know, I knew he was running that day. Uh, there wasn't going to be time to make out of... Um, proper meeting, and I just said to him, can I just, just pray for you as, we, uh, as you have breakfast? Um, um, I mean, hey, time for another name drop. Um, I, I have a PowerPoint that goes with this. I'm afraid you're being deprived of that, and you have to look at me. But um, uh, Princess Catherine did happen to be walking around the village one day when I was there. Disappointingly, it wasn't me she'd come to see, but there you are. I do have a, I do have a picture of her being there. Um, And I did have another absolutely ridiculous experience. Uh, I went to the, watch the marathon, uh, but it was a bit wet, so... Um, oh, I, I should say that I, I discovered again, as just part of the things, that there is a lounge called the Olympic Family Lounge. You know, that's where important people, uh, you know, like um, VIPs, uh, prime ministers, royalty, Olympic attaches, you get that. That's people like that go. Um, and uh, so I, uh, I found that at every venue there was this uh, Olympic, uh, Olympic family lounge, which is a great place to go because they bring you glasses of wine and, and f make you eat food and all that sort of thing. So anyway, uh, I went to the marathon. It was a bit wet outside, so hey, who wants to be outside when you can be uh, in the Olympic family lounge? And so I'm sort of standing here at my table with my computer working away, when one of the hostesses came over to me and said, I'm really sorry, but uh, we need your table. Uh, we need your table. Could you just move along a bit? And I thought to myself, OK, yes, I can move along a bit. And two minutes later, in comes Princess Beatrice. Um, I mean, frankly, I felt she should have come earlier. I mean, if she wanted the table, she should have been there earlier. But there we are. That wasn't how it works. I was, uh, uh, I was outranked. Um, but the great thing was that I, I was able to watch any event that I wanted. Uh, in, the, uh, in the athletics, there was this uh, Olympic family lounge with, um, uh, you know, it's a bit like an executive box type thing at a stadium uh, that there was, you know, I was watching through glass. Um, now, it's just an example of how my accreditation worked out in ways that I could never have planned. If I had an A on my accreditation, A for athlete, which, but if I had had an O, I would have got a, a nice seat in the, the best seat of the house. And at times I thought, well, what a shame I don't have an O. But then I realized afterwards, if I'd had an O instead of an A, i.e. Olympic family rather than athlete, I wouldn't have had access to the transport, the warm-up area, and I wouldn't have had the ministry opportunities. So, you know, God seemed to know what he was doing. Um, and so I was at the great privilege of being in the stadium for all the great moments of the athletics, the uh, you know, Super Saturday with the three medals in a couple of hours. Um, I had, a, again, I discovered that the, I was staying in a hotel in Limehouse, which is about four stations along in the DLR. And, uh, but I discovered that the best uh, way for me to get back there was actually to take the bus back into the village and then get the DLR from Stratford International, which was quiet, as opposed to fighting the crowds at Stratford. And uh, 
you know, because the restaurant's 24-7, uh, I would often just pop in there uh, on the way back, you know, in case I needed a little snack to keep me going on the way back, or a free drink, you know, why, why buy it when you can have it free at the Olympic uh, restaurant? But on the, the first day of the heptathlon, I suppose I had watched uh, it in the stadium, and then um, at, uh, I suppose about 11, something after 11 o'clock, I was back in the village on my way to, to, to get the train. And I go into the restaurant to pick up a drink, and there's Jess Ennis and uh, Katerina Johnson-Thompson sitting having dinner. I mean, well, obviously they would be having dinner at 11 o'clock at night if they'd been competing until about 10. But again, it just was a, one of those amazing, odd moments that, that just happened. And by the way, I can give you a little insight into the Olympics. Um, you will have seen at times or read about the empty seats in the stadium. You know, how can the stadium be sold out and yet there are empty seats? Now, the area for the Olympic family had 1,200 seats, but there were 1,800 people who had entitlement to sit there. But of course, those 1,800 people could be at the swimming, the athletics, the cycling, wherever. So it was a real issue for the people, the volunteers who were managing that, to have seats for everyone who wanted them, but at the same time not to have empty seats which looked bad on television. And so on a daily basis, they were deciding how many of the 1,800 seats they would keep, sorry, the 1,200 seats they would keep, uh, and at times they were selling them off to the public at short notice. Uh, the night that Usain Bolt uh, ran, about 1,400 people turned up to get into the 1,200 seats, and that was a bit of an issue for them. I knew all about that because I was in the Olympic uh, family lounge that night. I popped out to see an athlete uh, who had competed, and when I w went to go back in again, they said, I'm sorry, we can't let anyone else in uh, because uh, we're over our safety limit. Um, and there were a couple of um, real VIPs behind me who were... Um, far from gruntled, as they say, when this was happening, and were sort of giving the volunteers a piece of their mind about uh, how ridiculous this was, and they were entitled, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, so I felt I had more sympathy when I understood that with how you actually managed to have every seat full, but you have to get everyone in who's got the entitlement. Um, as I say, normally I was just watching through glass, but Occasionally, because I was there every night, the volunteers would say to me, look, um, it's, not, it's quite quiet tonight. If you want to sit out, you can. Or towards the end of the evening, they'd say to me, look, um, do you want to go out to the last, the last race? Uh, and I remember one of the first races that I saw uh, like that was the women's 100 meters. Um, and, uh, and that was a race which I'll always remember as say because I'd been watching through the glass and suddenly I was out there in the stadium watching it. And that was won by um, the person with probably the longest name in Olympic history because she's double barreled, double barreled. Shelly Ann Fraser Price. And uh, I had the privilege of meeting her at Birmingham a couple of weeks later when she ran in the Diamond League. And um, she said a couple of things. She said, you know, a lot of people believe that if you don't win, God isn't there. But I believe that God is always with me, whether I win or whether I lose. And just to be able to stand on the start line and think, I am a child of God, makes me special. Makes me able to say, Lord, whatever I'm doing today, I'm doing it for you. And I hope that through my running, he gets the glory. I hope that he will enjoy my running because this is my worship, my way of worshiping him with the talents he has given me. And then she went on to say that as a person, she is quite fearful. And so she said, when I am just preparing to go on my blocks, I always say to myself, and remind myself that God has given me a spirit of boldness and not a spirit of fear. And 
I say to myself, why should I be afraid if God is controlling everything? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. There's nothing in life I should fear other than God. And I have reverence in his presence. And she said, you know, I tried to say to myself, I might win, I might lose, but God will still be God afterwards. And I just thought that was phenomenal, that somebody on an Olympic final or wherever was actually quoting scripture to herself uh, and such, a, such, a, such an absolutely brilliant attitude. Um, it was the, absolutely the experience of my life. And just before I, I, I close, I just want to just talk very briefly about the Paralympics. I was also involved in the Paralympics. And I find that that challenged me a great deal because you know, I've worked in sport for 20 years and I never had anything to do with Paralympics before. Um, and I felt rather guilty about that. Um, I, uh, I was again, I, uh, this time I was actually writing for the Oxford Mail and also supporting athletes. Uh, the bad news from my point of view was the dress size was rather big in Oxford, so I found myself at the dress size three three days. Now, I, I don't know a lot about horses. I think the head's the front, but, you know. Um, but, you know, just to, to have the privilege of being with people, I mean, I can remember a South African runner um, who was favourite for the 100 and the 200 um, with cerebral palsy. And he came forth in the 100. And he was in tears afterwards, and just amazing privilege for me to be there and just to listen to what he wanted to say. And I remember him saying to me, you know, I said I'd give God the glory if I won, and I'm going to give him the glory even though I didn't win. And then to see him win the 200, which was, again, a great moment to be able to rejoice with him. Um, I became really quite a fan of goalball. You know, goalball is that the game for the uh, people with visual impairment. Uh, incidentally, I've learned to say people with visual impairment, not people who are visually impaired, because uh, the difference being that it's something they have rather than what they are. That, you know, it's, it's, you, you don't define the person by what they are. And interestingly, also, the, the correct way of describing um, sport which isn't disabled is non-disabled sport, not able body, which... Because as somebody said, you know, you talk about being normal. Is Usain Bolt normal? Um, and just, you know, to see people who, who, you know, you may think of them as disabled athletes, but actually they're, they're athletes. And their attitudes are just the same, and they want to compete in their sport. Um, and I went to a press conference with Ellie Simmons. I just wanted to meet her because I thought she's such an amazing person. And one of the, one of the, people who was looking after said, you know, yesterday, Ellie was in Sainsbury's. And we heard somebody saying, look, there's that swimmer. And that was a really a breakthrough moment that they didn't say, there's that Paralympic swimmer, there's that dwarf swimmer, but there's that swimmer. And to me, that was one of the challenges, actually, is to look at Paralympians, really, as, as people. But there are some absolutely hilarious moments. I have got a great friend who is uh, an amputee runner. Uh, and I was recently taking her to where she lived, and she said to me, uh, can we go via the university? I've got to drop off my legs. <laughs> and she did. She had them in a bag. <laughs> so, um, it just was the experience of my life. Uh, such a privilege to be part of the Olympics. Uh, amazing privilege you know, to pray with people. There was one particular athlete um, I just bumped into as we were going to the stadium uh, and uh, I said to the athlete, look, shall I sit with you on the bus or do you want to be left alone? The athlete said, yes, yeah, sit with me. Uh, we get to the, uh, we get to the warm-up area. The athlete says to me, I'm knackered. I'm going to have a sleep. But, and I said, okay, well, hope it goes well. See you later. And the athlete said, no, no, I want to see you before I compete. And so uh, just before the call time, the athlete came walking with the coach, last instructions with the coach, and then came over to me for a prayer. And just what a privilege. And then to see the athlete win a medal. Just incredible experience. 
Um, I remember another Kenyan athlete whom I met in the famous tunnel. And I, I'd, I'd bumped into the, uh, the athlete uh, in, dining, in the dining room that day, uh, and we just talked a little bit. And so anyway, we met in the tunnel, and the athlete stopped me and said, um, today at lunchtime when we met, you didn't pray for me. Can you pray for me now? And I mean, just amazing privilege of being in those situations. Um, and just being there to, to help support and to help uh, elite sports people just come to terms with the competition in a Christian way. Uh, and to deal with the fear, the expectation, um, and, and all of that. Um, and I love sports. Sports has been part of my life. I, I'm sure it's the same for many of you. And I would just say, you know, never, never feel guilty or negative about your involvement in sport because I believe it's a gift from God. I believe also it's a wonderful opportunity to get alongside people and, you know, not in uh, an aggressive way, but just a simple, natural way of sharing your faith, simply by the way you live your life before them. Um, and, uh, and as you follow sport, pray for it. You know, pray for the local rugby team. Pray for sports people who live in, live, live in your midst. Um, as it happens, um, I, my, my daughter lives in Bradford and Avon, and they're terribly proud of uh, having their golden letterbox court say of Ed McKeever. You know, but just as you think about people, just pray for them. Um, and I'm just going to close by giving you another of my little devotionals that I was sending to Olympians, which was called Perspective. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. As an Olympian, an Olympian I know described his quest for a gold medal as everything and nothing. He had had a good career, world champion, broken the world record, lots of lesser successes, but he didn't have a gold medal from the Olympics. It was really all that his career lacked. And he realized that if he retired, he would be looked upon as the athlete who didn't win the Olympics. On the other hand, would winning the Olympics change him? He didn't have a sense personally that anything was missing, and of course, an Olympic gold medal is important because if not, why have you pushed yourself for the last four years in training? Is it not to achieve whatever you're capable of? Why have you made all those sacrifices for something that doesn't matter? Yet in the light of eternity, winning or losing in the Olympics is not so significant. And remember that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Give the competition your best shot, but remember that the outcome won't change who you are. Keep it in perspective. Finally, um, in the unlikely event that anything I have said has been of any interest to you today, um, I have written a, a book called What the Book Says About Sport, What the Bible Says About Sport, published at five pounds, but the amazing slug and lettuce price, two pounds. Yes, two pounds. Um, I've got some of these. Um, if uh, anyone would uh, be interested in having one, uh, I'd be delighted to take your money. I mean, I'd be delighted to, uh, uh, to let you have it. Um, I'm fine to answer any questions if anyone wants to ask any questions, but I'll hand over to Matt since uh, I've had my 40 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.